Mm -hmm. Hello. I don't know what that was, a combination of hi and hello. Uh, so both of those and welcome. Thanks for being here. Hmm. The, the title for tonight's talk is a likeness. A likeness. And it's actually a real word. It didn't quite sound like a real word, but um, it is. It is apparently, uh, and this is inspired by, oh, letting somebody in. This is inspired by uh, something that beautiful, wise elder and teacher Maya Angelou um, said in an interview that uh, sparked my curiosity about a likeness. Dr. Maya Angelou, what an extraordinary person. Um, it's really interesting to read about her accomplishments and, you know, what just read her books, watch her interviews. There's just uh, amazing wisdom. Mm, she, among other things, began as a dancer and actor in um, musicals, Porgy and Bess, namely, and toured Europe. Uh, and that exposed her to lots of different languages. So she actually was could speak six languages. Uh, she became an editor um, and then a screenwriter um, and a director of some a couple movies. And of course, an author and a poet. She and I was looking up how many books has she written? Because her most well known would be "I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings," extraordinary, and um, and "Still I Rise" is another one that lots may have heard of. But she actually has forty nine books, <laughs> prolific. So several autobiographies and uh, other stories and uh, lots of children's books, um, lots of poetry books, and also cookbooks. She was also a chef and uh, published, I think, two cookbooks, but it may be more. Um, yeah, a amazing person, and, and I've learned a lot from her teachings um so in this one interview uh the interviewer was asking her about her kind of reviewing a uh, time in the 60s i think when she was good friends she called them her brothers with um dr martin luther king and with malcolm x and the interviewer tried to suggest, she said uh, that they were both very different men. You know, she was trying to allude to how Malcolm X was um, different than Martin Luther King. And uh, Maya was quite quick to say, uh, no, not really. Uh, they're not really that different. And she named, you know, that they're both ministers, they're both activists, they're both um, insulted and hurt by injustice. And then she, she points out that one is Muslim and one is Christian. Um, but then she says this, which is what hooked me. The truth is, human beings are more alike than we are unalike. Human beings are more alike than we are unalike. And that was helpful for me to hear in a time where unalikeness feels pretty up. <laughs> this uh, sense of, you know, how these people are doing things and how um, I can align myself with this group and not with that group. Or, um, yes, politicians, etc., and uh, a real sense of unalikeness, 
And so I, I, uh, it stood out to me. Uh, Maya goes on to teach, as she does with all of her wisdom, uh, this interviewer, interviewee, interviewer, um, inner dialogue there. Uh, she says, if I cry, you understand that. And the way she says it, like she does this pause, if I cry, and then you could see her touch into that grief part for a moment, there's this silence. And, so, and then she says, you understand that? The interviewer's nodding, yes, of course. And then she says, and if I mourn, you understand. We all understand tears and mourning and grief. And uh, she says, if you are yearning for something, I see that. So she's just so beautifully pointing out <laughs> our interconnectedness at the root of all things. And uh, not just these sorrows, you know, that she mentioned, crying and mourning, yearning, uh, but also our joys. This is the practice of mudita in, uh, in Vipassana, uh, a resonant joy. When you are joyful and celebrating and, and well and feeling loved, I feel that, and vice versa, or a likeness. And she says, the truth is, we know each other. And sometimes we tell, tell ourselves that we don't. And we might tell ourselves the opposite, that nobody really knows me. Nobody really knows what this is like. So it can go both ways, where we're not understanding and allowing ourselves to recognize that we are seen and known, and um, we can all relate, you know, to different degrees, but these core aspects of humanness are same, same. Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, I've shared the link to Maya Angelou's website um, down below in the YouTube recording here and also to this poem from Thich Nhat Hanh, which is a difficult poem. A lot of people, uh, you know, it's uh, has um, it's very painful in places and many people find it really hard to because in this poem, he explicitly suggests names, the interconnectedness uh, of not only with those who suffer from cruelty, but also with those who perpetrate it. And of course, Thich Nhat Hanh is a great wisdom teacher that... Uh, and it's so powerful for him to write and speak this poem. And uh, he, he has related the uh, impetus for this poem arising in him uh, came from, of course, a true story of um, a young girl, Vietnamese refugee fleeing in the, in the boats um, who um, was raped and mm, jumped into the ocean to drown herself afterwards. And it's uh, so stark and so violent and so shocking a thing for him to actually speak about in this way in this poem it's very powerful and i understand it's super painful um and and 
and it's important. So um, in Thich Nhat Hanh's own words, he says, when you first learn of something like that, you get angry at the pirate who um, raped her. You naturally take the side of the girl. And as you look more deeply, you will see it differently. He says, if you take the side of the little girl, then it's easy. You only have to take a gun and shoot the pirate. But we can't do that. He said, in my own meditation, I saw that if I had been born in the village of the pirate and raised in the same conditions he, as he was, I would now be the pirate. He says, I can't condemn myself so easily. In my meditation, I saw that many babies are born along the Gulf of Siam, hundreds every day. And if we educators, social workers, politicians, and others don't do something about the situation, in 25 years, a great number of them will become sea pirates. That is certain. And if you or I were born today in those fishing villages, we might become sea pirates in 25 years. So if you take a gun and shoot the pirate, you shoot all of us because all of us are to some extent responsible for this state of affairs. <clears throat> so I will um, read this poem now. Please call me by my true names by Thich Nhat Hanh. Don't say that I will depart tomorrow. Even today I am still arriving. Look deeply. Every second I am arriving to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond, and I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12 year old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills all four oceans. Please call me by my true name so I can hear all my cries and laughter at once. So I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. At another time, Maya Angelou, uh, when she received her honorary doctorate from Chapman University, 
she was giving her uh, acceptance speech to a packed hall of mostly students. And she was talking to them about um, how can you know the power of one person, she asked the group. Um, she was talking about the power of one person to change the world. And uh, so she said, each one of us has the chance to be a light on someone's path. And each one of us has had the light shine on us, or we wouldn't be here. So this is another example of our interconnectedness and how we are both have the opportunity, opportunity to give and to receive what's being referred to here as the light love, compassion, presence, wisdom, care, all these aspects of um, compassion, really. And, uh, and to, to really feel how without this, we wouldn't be here. In uh, with unknown ways, sometimes um, unseen people, random acts of kindness, generosity, spontaneous acts of beauty, um, as well as all the all the teachers or kind people in community, hmm, family, friends teachers, mentors, loved ones that have um, shone this light of compassion on us, have enabled us to keep showing up, keep waking up, keep striving to do our best. And uh, be agents of, of change and kindness because it, we see that the other is also possible within us. I know I have thoughts of separation and othering and comparison and judging. And these can be, when they're seen with wisdom, they can mm, be part of the Dharma in that they inspire us to wise speech, wise action, wise thought, wise meditation, the whole of the Eightfold Path. And, uh, and our own deep inner work of uh, <laughs> renunciation, right effort with what is with greed, hatred, and delusion that's within us. We have the good fortune to somehow be here looking to practice meditation, looking to cultivate care and wisdom. And this is rare and precious and um, something to reflect on of all the infinite factors that have, have brought us to practice quite profound. Sharon Salzberg teaches a really beautiful reflection, which we're going to use as part of the meditation practice tonight, uh, about this kind of theme of um, what has uh, supported us to be where we are now, including the people that um, have been harmful to us because they also have been part of how we got here, where we said, I don't want to be causing harm to others. I felt that impact of harm, and I'm searching and cultivating and practicing another way to be caring with myself and with all beings. Um, and so we include also awareness of, 
of these people that um, have have also been part of how we got here. Um, I think that's all. Ended up being a short one tonight. Is there anything else? No. <laughs> so we're going to um, practice with this first. Sometimes in meditation, we use reflection. Not always, but uh, it can be helpful. So once we settle into the meditation, we'll open to this type of reflection and inviting in uh, these different beings and acknowledging them, acknowledging ourselves, and then practicing um, some, um, I haven't decided yet, compassion or breath. I'll know when I get there. <laughs> so adjust your posture for practice, anything you need to be upright and restful and supported. Mm. And take your time as you settle into your posture. Mm. Sometimes we can be a little bit quick to mm, sit like a meditator or be still or be something and uh, when we're practicing in this way of compassion uh, it can be helpful to just go in slowly so see if you need any movement or stretch or touch if it's helpful to look around your space If it's helpful to maybe roll the shoulders or set aside any other distractions. Some people like uh, to dim their lights or turn away from the computer. So that you really have um, attended to your body in a way that when you come to stillness, it really feels like, ah, not imposing stillness, but just ready to rest, ready to settle. So the, that topic and the words of the poem and the, that painful, Examples in the poem can be quite triggering, of course. So you may need some comforting touch, perhaps a hand on the heart or belly, or holding your face. If it feels too intense to have the eyes closed, you could have the eyes slightly open and just resting downward or resting on an object of peace or beauty or calm in your space. The words of the poem may have activated our nervous system, so see if it's helpful to rest back towards the spine and down towards the tailbone, back and down, shoulders could drop. If you're in a seated posture, feeling the presence, the width, the weight of hips, legs, and feet connecting with the earth, 
If you're in a reclining posture, feel the back or side body on the support, connecting with earth. A gentle awareness of the whole body, just in a field of awareness around and through the body. Just lightly noticing any tensions that aren't needed right now. Could they let go or soften a little bit? Checking into the tensions of the Face neck and shoulders. Heart center, belly center, softening. Again, using touch if it feels helpful. Relaxing hands. And just in this sphere of awareness, just a general field around the whole body. in a spacious way, just a light touch of knowing breathing is happening. You don't have to go in tight and focused on the breath for this meditation, just keep it spacious, awareness, breathing in, awareness is breathing out. It might even feel as if the whole body is breathing, expanding and relaxing. And then touch into, feel this support come in to your awareness, to awareness of your wise intentions, why you showed up for yourself, for others, for all beings. Why do you come to practice? It would be easy not to, and you're here. You feel that wise intention, part of the Eightfold Path, really supporting you, like it's got your back, it's your ground. And then as Sharon Salzberg has inspired this practice, she 
invites us to see who comes to mind, who comes into awareness, heart, mind. When you reflect on who has been involved directly or indirectly in you being here right now, showing up for yourself, for practice, for wisdom, for kindness, for yourself, for others, for all beings. You may have been a neighbor who was kind and inspired you to know there's other ways of being. Could have been a teacher or a great teacher like Maya Angelou, Sharon Salzburg, Thich Nhat Hanh, Dalai Lama, etc. Maybe someone shared a book with you about meditation or you heard a poem. There may be conversations that planted seeds of another possibility, another way of being. some support or kindness that was given to you. And so these next few minutes of silence together, let's just reflect and invite in, see who is here with you. These kind beings. might also include animal companions and teachers. And as each of these beings passes into awareness, let them kind of surround you, support you, feel their presence nearby. Even if it's an author of a book that you've never met or heard them speak, their words, their wisdom touched you in some way, inspired you. Keep inviting in. For myself, I think of my teachers, many teachers, and all of their teachers and all of their teachers, this massive ripple. And I think of all the conditions that brought me to the Dharma. If that hadn't happened, that wouldn't have happened, etc. As the Buddha said, that being, this is.
Sharon Salzberg says that we may feel so alone and apart at times. But the truth is, our lives are embedded in this greater fabric. This vast interbeing. Reconnecting to or reaffirming the felt experience of your presence here and now, embodied, centered, present, held by, informed by, supported by this great interconnected web. And then very gently to whatever degree feels safe and comfortable for you, Sharon also invites those people whose words and actions have harmed us. You don't need to bring them into a close felt experience. Keep your energetic boundaries um, if that feels helpful but just seeing that they are also a part of why we're here. And the choices we have made to follow this path of care and wisdom. Another moment with that part of the reflection. We won't stay with that very long. You can keep them kind of in a wider diameter of awareness, but just know that they're also part of why we're here. Taking a sighing breath or a deeper breath if it's helpful and really reconnect with the body and the support of the ground. Softening any tension that has arisen in habit places of belly, shoulders, jaw, etc. And then from this place of centeredness and presence, connecting to this truth and felt experience of our interconnectedness, 
all of us here practicing together, the infinite numbers of people practicing a massively wide variety of practices that are cultivating care, kindness, wisdom in this very moment. A gentle awareness, including those who have been harmed and those who are the perpetrators of harm. And seeing the truth, knowing the truth. If I cry, you understand that. And if you mourn, we understand. And if you're yearning for something, we all see that, we all know. We are more alike than we are unalike. We know each other and we are known. We'll rest together in silence, embodied, a wide sphere of awareness, breathing. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and my laughter at once, so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open, the door of compassion.
Thank you for your practice. If you are joined us here on this YouTube Sangha, please check the links below for Maya Angelou's work and uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's poem. And um, see you again. There won't be, uh, I won't be here next week. I'll be in Tamagami backpacking and canoeing and uh, but I'll be back the 17th so we'll see you then.